to come into your house to worship. 
Um, we pray that we will just worship you with all that we have. Um, we pray for Michael as he comes to bring the message later on, Lord, and just um, bring us back, help us worship, and help us just focus on you and all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Y'all can be seated for just a minute. Um, so we want to welcome you to Hepzibah. Um, as you can tell, I am not Tim. Um, <laughs> Tim is on an anniversary trip this week, so I'm filling in a little bit. We are so glad to see you here this morning. We are glad if you weren't here last week, back from traveling, back um, to worship with us. Um, so we are just going to continue to worship and sing. We're going to sing, Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King, and Lord, I Need You. So um, just continue to be a part. Just continue to worship with us. Um, so if you want to go ahead and stand back up, and we will sing.
and tell them how glad you are to see them this morning. A white Jeep has a horn going off. No, nobody look at her. It'll make her feel embarrassed now. Don't, no, -uh. stop, stop looking. Y'all are looking, stop. As you're making your way to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians 5, 22 through 20, or 22 through 20, 33, wow, I'll get it right in a second, has one of the longest statements in all of the New Testament on the relationship between husbands and wives. And when we look at the political and moral landscape of our country today, it is easy to see that the foundations of marriage are completely eroding away. In fact, I would argue that the very fabric of marriage is holding on by a thread. And that thread is being attacked by Satan every single day so that every fiber of that thread threatens to give way at any moment. When you look at our culture today that one does not need to look far to see how Satan is waging war against the institution of marriage. The song of the year in 2020 was a song that praised the conditions of something that I would be embarrassed to speak of here. This was the song of the year for 2020. The artist released a new song recently praising the sexual promiscuity of women. These songs were touted by media and other people that are in this movement and attack by Satan. They were praised as empowering women. These songs in our culture celebrate things that are absolutely abominable to God. Where is the church in this cultural fight? Where is the church in this cultural fight where Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network actively show shows that are promoting sexual confusion and gender identity crises in our children's lives? The Oscars recently passed new standards for their movies stating that they had to have a certain percentage of on-air time and behind-the-scenes time for individuals in the LGBTQ plus community. This is the culture that we live in, both in America and in the world today. The fight that Satan has against the institution of marriage between one man and one woman is waging more than ever before. Where is the church in this fight? Where is the church in the fight to stand up and say, we are leading the charge, showing how to have a biblical marriage? Where is the church? Our society today has continued down this slippery slope trying to redefine and diminish the value of marriage. In 2015, the United States Congress passed a law in Obersfield versus Hodges recognizing and legalizing same-sex marriage. This decision began to further erode the foundations of marriage such that states tried to pass laws, and many did, where now all you need, like in the state of Alabama, all you need to get married is a notary certificate on your marriage license. You don't need the pastor. These states did that to remove the pastors out of the fray, to try and protect the pastors. But you see how the wage of the war on the institution of marriage has diminished the value, so lowered and lowered and lowered. Rick and I, whenever we try to talk to young couples, whenever we try to do marriage counseling, we don't do much of that at all because it's just so, so sticky of an issue. When we talk to young couples like Zach and Camille about what marriage is, about what it means, what the covenant that you were entering into, our culture has diminished this thing so far that often we are confused on what the definition and understanding of marriage is in Scripture. I would even say that much of the church today does not understand how much the culture has eroded these foundations of marriage. And to put it bluntly, I'm convinced that much of the church today has ignored God's expectations and standards for marriage in the church today. In a culture that continues to diminish these values, I hope and I pray that we desperately need to cling to a biblical foundation and understanding of marriage that Paul lays out here. But before we even get to understanding what Paul is saying in Ephesians 5, we must come to wrestle with this one question. Am I going to live my life according to the expectations and the standards of this world? Or am I going to submit my life 
and my marriage to the Word of God. Today's passage in Ephesians 5 is a sticky passage that often is avoided because it talks about things like women submitting and men being the head. Often this passage is avoided because there are so many circumstances that are in this church or any church in particular that I can't even begin to describe and explain what you as an individual have gone through and withstood in your current marriage, in your former marriage, or in your future marriages. I do not pretend to stand up here in almost six years of marriage and pretend to have an expert knowledge on what it means to be married. I do not pretend to stand up here for having been married for almost six years, having an understanding fully on what it means to love my wife like Christ loved the church. I am not Dr. Phil or Oprah. I do not have the expectations and the answers to be able to answer everything about what you may be experiencing in your marriage. But I hope and I pray that you see today the foundations that God has laid out in Ephesians chapter 5 and let us all surround ourselves around these fundamental truths so that we can have a biblical understanding of what it means in marriage. So with that, let's dive into Ephesians 5, 22 through 23 this morning. Verse 22 says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now that the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water through the word, so that he might present to the church and to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are many members of his body. Verse 31, he quotes Genesis chapter 2, which says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This, is, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now this morning, I want to explore three foundational truths that we see here in Ephesians chapter 5, and then we'll start unpacking some roles and responsibilities for the husbands and the wives. Now, single people, don't tune me out because hopefully one day you might get married, and you will need this. You will need the example from your parents. You will need the example from your grandparents. Those of you that may have been divorced or are currently divorced and single, do not tune this message out because you see here Paul is explaining that the the church, the marriage is very fundamental to how God loves us. Let us dive into these three foundations. Foundation number one, marriage is for the glory of God. Marriage is for the glory of God. Everything in Ephesians 5 revolves around the glory of God, specifically the glory of God in Christ. Look at verse 22. Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. It surrounds around God. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave him, himself up for her. The love that we have as husbands stems for Christ's love for the church. Verse 29, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. Again, talking about the husband's love, but how Christ loved the church in that way. Everything in Ephesians chapter 5, everything in marriage, surrounds itself around the glory of God, specifically in Christ. Everything comes back to the displaying this glory of God, imitating Christ, obeying Christ. Marriage exists for the glory of God. To put this another way, marriage exists for God more than it exists for you. We do not enter into marriage to satisfy our flesh. We do not enter into marriage because it would be a good financial decision. We do not enter into marriage because we like that person. We enter into marriage because God has ordained this institution. We enter into marriage to glorify God. In our selfish and narcissistic world that tries to make marriage about your satisfaction, your fulfillment, your pleasure, your expectations, the Bible states clearly that marriage isn't for you. It is for God. This is the first foundation because without it, the entire institution of marriage would fade away. 
If it was about me, marriage would have gone away a long time ago. If it was about me or you, the institution of marriage would have faded long ago. Marriage does not exist to make you happy. Marriage exists to make you holy. Any husbands in here know this for a fact, that our wives help sanctify us. Our wives help correct us. Our wives help dress us. Without them, we would be lost. Wives in here also hopefully understand that marriage is for God, that your husband corrects you, your husband encourages you, your, your, your husband gives you tasks to do that you didn't know that you needed to do. Marriage is for God. It is about your edification. And if you walk into Christian bookstores, although there aren't many of them left today, or if you browse online stores and websites, they are full of books talking about key things to unlocking a happier marriage. They talk about ten steps to having a better marriage. They talk about five steps to be a better husband. They talk about four love languages so that you can love your spouse better. They talk about one truth that the man needs to understand and the woman needs to understand in order to have better communication. They talk about anything and everything, but do not miss this important reality this morning, church. The question that will determine the state of your marriage is, is God the Lord of my life? Is God the Lord of my life? It is so easy to come to that question and just casually brush it off of, yes, absolutely. And yet we live our lives, we walk day to day, the words that come out of our mouths to our parents, to our spouse, to our future spouse, or anything but showing that the Lord is Lord of our life. If is your wife, is your life, is your husband's life, is your wife's life submitted to his lordship? This is foundational. And if any of our discussion points start with what works best for me, we are starting at the wrong point of marriage and we are starting at the wrong point of Christianity altogether. Husbands and wives, young men and young women, if you are starting with your satisfaction and your expectations based on movies or what the culture says, you will be let down every single time. This is why I was blessed with such a wonderful wife that I have. She had no expectations because she didn't date anybody before me. If your expectations are at a certain point, your husband or your wife will never be able to fulfill those expectations. If you expect X in your marriage to be like what the movies and the culture describe, you will always be let down every time. If you look to the Word of God and you look to having a strong Christian marriage where your husband and your wife are following Jesus more than they are themselves, you will have a stronger marriage. This leads us to the second foundational truth this morning of marriage. Foundation number two is that the grace of God is the only hope for marriage. The grace of God is the only hope for marriage. Marriage is difficult. Amen? Wives, don't amen too loudly. Marriage is difficult. The grace of God is the only hope for marriage. Problems in your relationship are not solved by getting married. Problems in your relationship are not solved by having children. Problems in your relationship are not solved by any thing other than God. And yet when we read so many books, when we see so many seminars, when we watch so many movies that go through different things, if we browse these books, they're going to boil their solutions down to communication problems, to personality clashes, to financial styles and differences, to problems with his expectations, her expectations, problems with kids, problems with the in-laws. Problems are everywhere. And I don't want to oversimplify things this morning in marriage by stating this, but there's a problem in every marriage, and it's called sin. The primary problem in every marriage is sin. Not the only problem. The primary problem is sin. This is extremely important because as long as we come to books and conferences and seminars and online trainings and experts on how to deal with our marriages, how to fix certain things, and we come to face-to-face, -face, until we come face-to-face -face with the problem of sin that's at the core of every single one of our hearts, that we will be putting Band-Aids on broken limbs every time. If you try to solve your problems in your relationships at work, in marriage, or elsewhere with anything other 
than the gospel, we have come to a wrong place. Are there action points, action steps, real applicable things like washing the dishes, picking up your laundry, closing the toilet lid? Are there actual things that can solve problems in marriage? Absolutely. But until you come to the core of you are a sinner, you will never come to the solution because the primary solution is that marriage, the primary solution in marriage is the Savior. Until Lord, until Jesus is the Lord of your life, you will always have problems in your marriage. Even after Jesus is the Lord of your life, you will continue to have problems in marriage. I become a better husband by walking closer to Jesus. You become a better husband by walking closer with Jesus. You become a better wife by walking closer to Jesus. It is not found in books or anything else that this world has to offer. It is found in the gospel of Christ. Do not miss this reality this morning, church. We need the gospel every single day to take up our cross daily and follow after Jesus so we can love our spouses the way that God loved the church, so we can love our spouses and serve and sacrifice and do all the things that our flesh does not want to do because of the way that we have been transformed by Christ. We don't need more books. We need a deeper understanding of the gospel. We need a deeper understanding of scripture. God, help us see this this morning. God, forgive us for running after books rather than running after you. Look with me in verses 22 through 25. Verse 22 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in everything to their husbands. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave herself up for her. Then Paul continues this, ver- this thought in verses 31 through 32. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and to the church. Do not miss this this morning, church. In order for the world to get a picture of who Jesus is and what the gospel is, They're going to see it in your marriages. The marriage is a picture of the gospel. When people look at your marriage, what do they see? When people look at the relationships that you have at work, what do they see? When people look at the relationships that you have with your children, what do they see? If they don't see Jesus, then you may be leading them astray. The reality for far too many marriages in our culture today and especially in the church today, is that they look exactly the same as the world around us. The divorce rates are similar to the culture. Pornography consumption among men and women are similar to the culture. If we look around the world today and compare the church to the culture, there may not be as much of a difference. What is that conveying to the world around us about Jesus? If people are supposed to be looking at our marriages in order to see the gospel, what are they really seeing? This is exactly what we've talked about for the last few weeks as Rick and I have gone through this. Paul is exploring in Ephesians, this back half of Ephesians, how we in the church are supposed to be different. How we in the church are supposed to be separate from the world around us. This is Paul's point here. In your marriages, you are supposed to be different than the world around us. Men, when you are around other groups of men, that may mean not joking on your wife about the old ball and chain. Women, that may mean whenever you are around other groups of women, you are not gossiping about how your husband won't do X or Y at home as you've asked him to multiple times. It may mean a lot of different things in a lot of different relationships for you and for I. But the reality remains that people should see the gospel through our lives. Again, I am not an expert on marriage or what it means. And my marriage is by no means perfect. But the reality remains the same. This is a foundation of Scripture. Our marriages and our relationships display the gospel to those who are not in this church and who are not in this world. Foundation, or rather, this this leads us into what the roles and the responsibilities are for us this morning. The husband's role, as laid out in Scripture, is to be the head of the family. The husband's role is to be the head of the family. Now I want to note that this is a statement of fact 
not a statement of reality. This is a pulpit. That is a pew. This is a church building. This is a speaker. Those are statements of fact. It is not open to reality. There's a lot of things in Scripture that may not convey very well in English, but it is very clear in the original language. What Paul is saying here is that the husbands are the head of the family. That is not open to opinions or open to our culture that wants to redefine what the structure of a family looks like or redefine what the roles in a family are. How it plays out in your home is up to you and your spouse. How it plays out in your workplace is up to a different thing. It all changes based on where we are as individuals, but the fact remains that the husband's role is as the head of the family. This doesn't mean that husbands always act like it, but the fact remains that husbands, you are the head of your family. Husbands, when you stand before God, you will be held accountable for how you led your family. You will not be judged by how much money you made. You will not be judged by how many deer you caught or killed. You don't catch deer. How many deer you killed? How many fish you caught? How many birds you killed? How many dogs you raised? You won't be judged by anything else as a husband other than the way that you led your family. How are you leading your family, husbands? How are you acting as the head? This leads us to some responsibilities for the husband. Husband's responsibility first is to sacrifice for his wife. Gentlemen, headship is not an opportunity for us to dominate our wives, to put the old foot down and tell our wives that I am the head and by George, this is what you are doing. That is not what Scripture teaches. And any, any indication of that is a miscommunication on my part, is a, maybe a misunderstanding on anybody else's of what Scripture teaches. This is not an opportunity for us as husbands and gentlemen to dominate the women and the wives around us. This is a sacrificial system that looks and to serves every single thing around us. Headship is a responsibility for you and I to die for our wives It is an opportunity to die daily, to sacrifice ourselves. Culture says to be macho. Culture says to defend yourself. Culture says to build up yourself, to look out for you. This is the opposite of what Scripture is teaching. If we are to sacrifice for our wives, this means that we die to ourselves, to give up our desires, our wants for our wife. This is the only reason that I go and eat Chinese food. It's because my wife wants to. I can't stand Chinese food. I'm coming to like it. But this is the only reason that I eat Chinese food. It's because I die to myself for her. This is me serving as the head, according to Scripture. Another responsibility that we see here in Scripture is to love your wife selflessly. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Husband, love your wives as Christ continues to love the church. This is a self-sacrificing love that is not based on what you get from her. This is not based on you doing certain things around the house so that you can get something from her. That is not a selfless love. This self-sacrificing love is not based on her positive characteristics or your expectations of her. This love is not based on whether she deserves it or not. According to Scripture, It is based on what Christ has already done. When you and I were sinners, Christ died for us. When your wife is a sinner, you die to her. This is a self-sacrificing love that Paul talks about and that God ordains in the institution of marriage. Paul will speak of this in the following sections of Ephesians, talking about how husbands are to lead their wives in the spiritual warfare that is waging on. Husbands, you and I are to protect our wives. Protect them physically, protect them spiritually. You and I, our headship roles play out in how we lead our families closer to Jesus. How are you leading your family closer to Christ? Are you allowing the things of this world to take over? To pull you and your family away from church? To pull you and your family away from the the joy and the fulfillment that you find here in this church body? Are you allowing the things of this world to pull away from you in your time and your quiet study at home? Men, how are you leading your children to be closer to Christ? 
This is what you will be judged for. You are to protect your home in both spiritual things and physical things. We are called to selflessly sacrifice our nap times and whatever else may wage war at us to try and pull us away so that we can defend and selflessly serve our families. So again, I ask you this morning, how are you leading your family to grow closer to God? How are you leading your children to grow closer to God? Is this a selfless love? Is this a self-sacrificing love? I'll give you a challenge. Ask your wife. Ask your wife if you are leading selflessly. Ask your wife how you, as the husband, can lead your family closer to Jesus. Ask your children how you're doing in leading them closer to God. If they're honest, and I hope women that are in here this morning will be honest, because you need to tell your husbands, Husbands, we need to take the challenge to lead in our homes. I'm so thankful when I look out in this church that there are so many men who are leading. Rick talks about it almost every Sunday. I'm so thankful for the men that we have in this church. But men, if this is the pinnacle of what you are going to be as a husband in your relationship with your wife or as a father to your children, if you're as good as you're ever going to get, that's a sad statement about how Christ is pursuing his church. We must constantly pursue our wives and our children to lead them closer to Jesus. Now Paul looks at the role and the responsibilities of the wives. The wife's role is to be the helper. Again, a statement of fact, whether we think it is or not. Husbands, whether you think your wife is a helper or not, it is a statement of fact. The wife is to be the helper. That is her role. There are a lot of implications into that statement in our culture today. There are a lot of implications for a lot of strong and passionate women that are here in this church. And I will be watching for knives that come into my back as I'm walking out today. I understand that this role has a lot of misconceptions surrounding it today. I understand that. But God's word still rings true. Wives, your role, according to Scripture, is to be the helper. The wife's primary role as the helper does not mean that she is less than her husband. The wife's primary role as the helper does not mean that she is less than her husband. Just because the man is the head and the wife is the helper does not mean that the man gets to put his foot down or that the wife has to cower at every decision that the man makes. That is not what Scripture displays. Not anywhere in Scripture does that show itself. The wife as the helper has been distinctly created by God in Genesis because men on their own needed somebody. And God saw this, and God said, I will make a helper for you. In Genesis, both man and women were both uniquely and distinctly created by God, both with equal value, dignity, and worth before God. Despite what our culture says, wanting to confuse what that means, You, in your biology, were given a role to play. You cannot do anything to change this role. It is what you will be held accountable for. Both men and women have distinct roles. The man is the head and the woman is the helper. Just as this is a speaker and this is a pulpit, this is a fact. The wife's responsibility now moves to how she should submit to her husband. Again, I understand that this is not a popular opinion or a popular word. Many marriage ceremonies now in today's culture ask for pastors to remove the word submit when we go through the marriage ceremony because they don't like the connotations that the word submit has. I can do a whole lot of English navigation and change up what a synonym for submit might be But the fact remains that it says that your responsibility as a wife is to submit. Now let's take our conceptions about what submission means and let's look at what Scripture said. The gospel and God designed marriage 
So that when we look into Scripture, when we look into what Jesus did, we as husbands learn how to love more, and we as wives learn how to submit more. And I could do a whole long tangent and spiel about how the, the triune Godhead works and about how Christ submitted to God the Father and how God the Father works as the head and how the Holy Spirit works in conjunction. I could do a whole lot of stuff about that. But that's not the point of today. The point of today is to talk about the gospel and our marriages. You as wives are to submit to your husbands just as Christ submits to the Father. Biblical submission is following your husband's leadership. Your husband's leadership means following you. It is, a, it is a co-thing. It just always flows in with each other. The wife looks at the husband to take her leadership. The husband looks to his wife to make sure that he is being a good leader. The wives are there to help. The husband is there to lead. It's always just moving back and forth with each other. This is what a picture of biblical submission looks like. It is not stomping the foot down. It is not saying this is what we are doing despite what you tell me. You cannot change my mind. Husbands, if you are loving your wives as Christ loved the church, you will never pull that card. Because it is impossible for you to love your wife as Christ loved the church and not care about what she thinks. Wives, it is impossible for you to love your husbands as Christ loved the church and disobey what his leadership says because he is trying to lead in a way that is best for your family. The wife's role is to submit. Biblical submission is a beautiful picture of how Christ loved the church, about how God works as a whole in with each other. The role of biblical submission and the beauty of marriage as a whole is that you two are so connected with each other, pulling in the same direction, that you will not do something without the other person's approval or talking to. Not because the other person is lording something over you, because you value that person's opinion so much. Do you think God the Father did something without talking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit? Again, I can go off on a whole long tangent about this, trying not to. But you, when you are pulling in the same direction, you are, you are united as one body, soul, and spirit pulling together in this beautiful thing. The, Bible's, the Bible does not say, wives, submit to your husbands if he is worthy or if he has earned it that day or last week or because of the past that happened. The Bible says, wives, submit. It is as clear as that. It is simple, yet it is complex in its application. Now, when the husband selflessly loves his wife and the wife selflessly submits to her husband, again, a beautiful picture of marriage emerges for all of us that we hope to emulate and to display. I hope and I pray for every single man in here, young, old, father, grandfather. I hope and I pray for every man in here. They will look around this church and they will see the men that are standing up leading their households well. And we will look to that and we will ask the difficult questions about how those men got to that point. I hope that every young man, whether married or not, in here this morning will look to an example that they have to follow and to serve and to love their wives as Christ loved the church. I hope and I pray for men in here that maybe have delegated your leadership in the household, that this would be a challenge to stand up. That this would be a challenge to stand up against the war that is waging in our homes and in our culture to take the role and the responsibility that is rightfully given to the husband. We will take it back. I hope and I pray for every man in here that we will love those around us as Christ loved the church. I hope and I pray for every woman in here that you will be challenged in your submission to your husbands. You will be challenged in how you love your husbands as Christ loved the church. I hope and I pray for every young and old woman in here that you will see an example played out in the young and old women in this church, that you will see the example that you are called to follow biblically. I understand that it is tough to lead as the head and to submit as the helper but the fact remains, and I hope and I pray that we are challenged this morning to follow in God's example of what marriage is supposed to look like. Will you stand with me this morning? Father, we thank you for what you are doing in our hearts and in our lives. 
God, when, when difficult subjects come up, like marriage, like the roles and the responsibilities that exist in marriage, God, I pray that we will learn how to follow your example, not the example that we have or the expectations that we have on those that are around us. God, I pray that we will love and we will submit and we will serve the way that you would have us to. God, I pray that as we come here this morning, if there is anyone here who does not have a relationship with you, if you are not Lord of their lives, God, I pray that you will convict them right now so they will trust in you because their problems in their marriage are not going to be fixed by behaviors or attitudes. Their problems in marriage are going to be fixed by coming before a holy God saying, I am a sinner, please fix me. God, I pray for every man and woman in here that we will learn how to love as you loved us. God, when we were sinners, you died for us. Not because we earned it, not because we deserved it, but God, because you loved us that much. God, I pray that our marriages will be surrounded by the love that is described in Scripture. God, I pray for the marriages that are in here this morning, that you will strengthen them. Regardless of what happened in the past, That is in the past. God, right now in their marriages, that you will strengthen them so that they can be better husbands and better wives, so that the outside world can look inside the church and see the picture of the gospel displayed in our marriages. It is in your holy and precious name we pray.